people in there. Uh, ah. Press recording. It's recording. All right. So any any of us can do it, right? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Any of us can do it. All right. So we can start, I guess. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Um, today's session is the first one with this new platform. So we got a few people here. So maybe we lost some on the way, but uh, hopefully not many. Um, the topic for today is this um, uh, HPC and HTC uh, end user landscape uh, review. We sent a form uh, two weeks ago uh, with a couple of questions, and this should be hopefully triggering some of the discussion. I see that some people don't have uh, microphones available, so. Hi, Alex. Can you hear me? I'm a little quiet. Can you hear me well, Jamie? Oh, I can hear you fine, yeah. Yes, okay. I'm here. I think we're fine. Um, I don't know if other people were just muted or if they're... Uh... Ah, okay, it's just muted. Okay. Can, can, can you guys hear me? Just... Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, thank, thanks. Sorry, we have a few teething problems on the new platform, probably. <laughs> None of us have used it in Angular before. All right. Just... It, it keeps telling me my internet connection is unstable, but yeah. I'll just keep going. It does that to me as well. I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't think it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, so the topic today was this um, um, HPC, HTC, and user landscape uh, with Jamie. We got some questions. It's kind of more to trigger discussion today. Uh, we can go through the replies and maybe um, stop on every topic and uh, discuss a bit. And uh, hopefully, like uh, one thing that would be nice is to, to kind of uh, come up with some next steps of what is needed in this area for uh, like the cloud native tooling uh, and what would be really useful for people. So if there's no other thing to start with, we can just start by going through the survey. Okay yeah, I guess uh, make sure people put their names on the agenda as well, like normal on the um, Actually, we don't need that anymore because we'll get the reports automatically from the platform. Oh, uh, really? I thought we said we were still going to do the Google Doc. That's fine. Okay, so no names. Ah. Um, I, I guess... think we can keep the agenda for the notes, but I don't think we need to collect the attendees anymore. Fine. So we just need to say, just ask if there's any new joiners. I mean, there aren't this time. but that That's true. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone joining for the first time. No, no, I recognize everyone. Yeah. Ricardo, will there be a way for the rest of us to see who did attend each of these meetings, if we if we want to follow up with anyone? That's a good point. I don't know, Abubakar, is the attendees list in the sessions public to everyone? No, it's not public. OK. Uh, so do we want to keep the agenda then with the names? We can also do that. I think it might still be helpful. All right. So that would be here. Oops. Your name, see that is. You're already there. So I'm talking. already there. <laughs> Wait, I'm screwing things up now. All right, so maybe we just go through. Yeah, everyone, if you can add your names there, and we can start by going through the through the questionnaire. I think we can stop at each one. And uh, if anyone has anything to highlight, I mean, we can discuss in detail. So the first question was, uh, what kind of solutions people are using for um, uh, high performance computing or high throughput computing and other batch like uh, workloads? So in total, we actually got uh, eight responses, which is not too bad, I would say, because it was kind of a long question. Um, so the Top two were Slurm and Pure Kubernetes, which is a pretty, I, I was a bit surprised actually. Um, then we had two for HD Condor, uh, and then we had one for Armada, uh, none for Volcano. I had added it just because uh, it's like a native Kubernetes scheduler or cloud native scheduler. There was one for Kubeflow, which is interesting, and then ancient Torque system. Um, so 
I think, uh, I don't know if anyone has any particular comments on this. Well, one thing that strikes me is that people are clearly using more than one thing as well. Uh, so that's not yeah. unique. We've only you know, got five, five people yeah. using Slurm and Vanilla Kubernetes, so they're also not unique. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. Maybe maybe a question here is for the ones that uh, if anyone here has answered with more than one, is that like a, from a transition to something new, or is it a plan to maintain both in parallel? And we're an example of people uh, of doing both uh, for, like, for, for a transition. So and that would be like Condor to Armada. Yeah, well, and also Vanilla Kubernetes actually, but yeah. So I was wondering too, you know, are we not, I, I would be surprised if there's really nobody using Volcano and Armada and other things like that, right? So like, you know, maybe maybe it's also kind of a call like, hmm, like maybe we need to put out feelers into those um, user groups and try to get them more involved with this SIG, right? Because uh, people who are doing, who are actually using that would certainly have overlap in what we're doing, I think. I wonder if there's ways we could reach out to those groups or even Kubeflow too. I mean, you know, that's, those are, I feel like those are, I don't know too much about Armada and Volcano, but I feel like those are those are non-zero user communities, right? Hmm. Now, Torque, eh, I'm not really interested in reaching out to that community. I'm just kidding. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's that's a good point, actually. And uh, for Volcano, they, they have quite a good structure of like weekly meetings. I think they are mostly targeting, or at least they're mostly have end users in Asia for now. And those are weekly meetings. And then they have like a, a every two weeks, they have a meeting that uh, is kind of Europe and North America friendly. One other note on the Volcano thing, um, depending on the group, they will not be able to access Google Docs or submit to Google Forms. Um, so like if trying to like that might segment off a you know other community there. But they can use this platform, right? Because I've had calls with them and they can only use Zoom, but I yeah. think they will also be able to use this uh, baby platform. Yes. Right. Um, but if uh, if creating a form for a global audience, uh, SurveyMonkey will work in um, in China. Oh, OK, that's a good point. So, oh, OK, I see. Yeah, but in terms of reaching out, maybe maybe that's a good point. We we can take as an action just to to advertise this group in these communities to see if they are interested in, in joining. It it's not like we cover every time this kind of work uh, topic either. Like there's a lot of things that they will probably not be so interested in. We need to find more people who are doing ML and data science and stuff like that. I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the other thing, uh, I don't know if, uh, like, Slurm ha has a pretty strong presence here. Uh, maybe maybe it would be nice to, to know more of how people are using Slurm and if they're deploying it on Kubernetes or managing it with Kubernetes, what, uh, what are their plans there as well? I don't know if anyone wants to expand on that. Yeah, do we have anyone on the call who is currently using Slurm? I can I can speak for my old job. Go on then. <laughs> um, yeah, they were using both a mix of Slurm and Kubernetes. Um, there wasn't any real transition plan to go from one to the other, um, but that's also it was uh, uh, the University of Michigan, um, and a good chunk of their users were very familiar with you know slurm they didn't really want to like interrupt their workflow the biggest thing was all the the newer researchers and people coming on board that were interested in using things like kubeflow using things like jupyter notebooks um so that was kind of the you know separation there yeah i mean uh or no obviously um you heavily uh using slurm lsf um i put them all kind of together right torque slurm lsf i guess you know torque's kind of on the outs, I guess, these days, but, you know, PBS, all those, right? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, certainly for us, right, the the vendor that we buy the supercomputer from at the scale that they're 
building, right? You know, like they're going to, it's going to come, it came with LSF, right? We bought an IBM machine, it came with LSF. So, you know, those sorts of things I don't think are going away for that traditional HPC community, kind of like what Bob's talking about, right? And so for us, it was the name of the game is like, how do we, how do we bridge that gap as much as possible? How can people use the Slurm commands, sbatch from inside of a container, that sort of thing. So that's the way, the direction that we've gone. But yeah, I don't, I don't see those getting supplanted. I mean, you know, they've got like 30 years of like industry research being poured into those batch schedulers. They're not going to like go away overnight. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So any, anything else in this topic? Uh, I guess for what it's worth, I do see more people looking to transition or at least support running both. Um, largely just because it's a lot, honestly, easier, especially these days, um, to get up and going in Kubernetes to potentially burst out to some place. Um, and a lot of the, at, at least at, at my old job, a lot of the researchers were more interested in using things like Kubeflow and, and it just made it a lot easier to get going there. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a both and, I completely agree, Bob. And one, one, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say like one question there would be, is there anything that is prohibiting people from moving towards using vanilla Kubernetes as the scheduler of choice? Or is it mostly just familiarity with the old stuff? So let's continue using what is not broken, I guess. Yeah, I think the answer there is there are things missing. And uh, at least for I us, see. at least for us, the things that are missing is uh, like, priority queuing, uh, the notion of a queue uh, yeah. on top of just the workloads on Kubernetes, and then the notion of fair share to mm -hmm. optimize the cluster usage. Uh, that's another one that is um, that is also stopping us. Uh, priorities and preemptions exist already at level of bots, so that's already yes. something there. Yes. Um, there. There was a really nice talk at the uh, last KubeCon from, um, I forget his name, you one from Apple? Apple, right, yeah, yeah, you shared that, I think, on the exactly. Slack analyst. yeah. So they are trying to implement those concepts on, on, the, on the scheduler, and this is also what, like, Volcano is doing similar things. Got it. Yeah. So then, and then, therefore, a follow-up would be, Kubernetes allows for custom schedulers. So, I mean, in fact, I think Volcano is an example of that. Uh, are people building their own custom schedulers because they are, Supposedly, I've not done myself, but supposedly fairly straightforward to build. So is it something that people consider and people say, we'll just build our own scheduler? Is that an option? Like I, I've seen people building their own scheduler. Uh, there was a, it was a problem for a bit because there weren't a lot of hooks into the various different points in which I see. You know, scheduling gets considered. Mm -hmm. However, uh, that has largely uh, changed. Um, I think as of the 120, one release. So, like this this past year, the, there was a, a significantly more hooks added mm -hmm. to uh, potentially, you know, to, to make ex writing or extending schedulers easier. I see. Okay. Yeah, it might be just it might be more than just hooking the scheduler as well. Like, if you want to introduce queues, you actually need to to handle the persistency of those queues. And if you want to have multiple queues and high handle priority, there's quite a yeah. bit of logic there that all these systems are very good at because they've been developed for ages now, uh, a lot Got of them. So, so it's not like a obvious transition. I see. Okay. Fair enough. That, that's it. Thank you. We, we looked at that briefly and um, the, the issue for us was that we wanted to be able to schedule across multiple clusters. And so, um, then you look at cube fed and that it didn't all work to do multiple clusters, which is why we ended up writing Armada. I mean, it, it was easy enough to do the uh, custom scheduler part of it, but not the multi-cluster part. So. I see. That's a good point. That's a good point. Actually, like well, the experiments we've been doing with managing things like HD Condor with Kubernetes, even if we are still submitting with Condor, we could have multiple clusters managing the condor uh, demons and then have central schedulers somewhere else. So we could kind of benefit from the Kubernetes uh, 
like operations uh, simplification, but then still use Conda as a scheduler. I always thought your uh, reason for not moving away from Conda was less about the lack of features in Kubernetes and more just the sort of inertia of being able to change user behavior and the fact that they want to add use Conda and <coughs> thousands of them. Yeah, but fair share, like fair share is, is is something that has to be there, basically. Yeah, but I mean, even if you did, let's say that was, you know, you either use Armada or yes. it was just in Kubernetes, even so, you'd still, you know, have to convince a large yeah. user base to start doing something differently. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of yeah. Pieces. I'm, I'm my gut feeling is that's actually the, the one of the main reasons that lots of these traditional places are using the traditional software because it's how things have always been done and it's kind of hard to force people to change I mean, and then uh, just, go ahead go ahead that was it, i was just gonna say on that point uh, i've been joining a, a bunch of uh hpc meetups and it's amazing how focused that group of people is on hardware like they're so into the late breaking hardware and how much uh, we're going to be able to pump over this PCI pipe and the DRAM and the this and the that and and they're just fascinated at throwing more hardware at the problem as opposed to what we're talking about which is how to use that hardware more efficiently and uh, you know uh, yeah I mean, I've gone to a couple of meetings now and it's absolutely at that lower level the entire conversation so just interesting where people's heads are at Got oh, one last question sorry so do you guys anticipate that the existing kubernetes ecosystem uh, or the existing kubernetes scheduler the default scheduler that comes with kubernetes will have options for a bunch of these uh, going forward or is this always going to be like you know default scheduler can only do this if you want something more specialized either build your own scheduler or like use this other open source scheduler and whatnot is that where do you see that going? I guess it's well, hard to tell. Me, me personally, I would expect that this goes into the into some not into the like necessarily upstream Kubernetes, but in some sort of like CRD and well Got supported it. by uh, yeah. like to make them almost first class resources, uh, even it. if Got they're it. implemented as uh, CRDs. Got it. And it's not only like uh, HPC, HTC, it's also the other yeah. workloads. That will yeah. 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 All right, I think we move to the next one then. That's question one. <laughs> All right, this one should be easier, I think. Um, so actually, the, this was pretty overwhealming on-premises. I think from all the responses we got, one that mentioned hybrid. So I think this is, uh, I think the, the main question is, is this staying like this or are people looking at uh, hybrid deployments as well? And what are the stoppers there? I mean, for us, it's staying like this. Uh, we're, we're certainly evaluating and exploring hybrid. For us, the bigger issues were um, th things like the United States um, government data protection stuff around FedRAMP um, authorizations and things like that. That uh, being a government entity, that's that's the biggest barrier. Um, but we are starting to explore that uh, that hybrid. Thing, but not not really for HPC. It would be more for um, for workloads um, that could that I don't know. We haven't. We don't. We don't. Certainly don't have any clear workloads that are like, oh, this would be perfect. It's really just kind of exploring what's even possible. So it's very very early stages. I would imagine a lot of this group have got a relatively established infrastructure. Have already have on prem, so it would start there. Um, probably all got various different degrees of security concerns as well, and you sort of know what you have and how to trust it. And also probably just large data sets as well, which is probably a factor which might keep you on-prem because, you know, transferring large amounts of data around in the cloud could be prohibitively expensive. And also needing that equivalent amount of compute to be able to make good use of it. 
one of the reasons uh, the University of Michigan was looking at it was because a lot of the grants were coming with like cloud credits. So it'd be a lot easier to give people one interface that they're familiar with and just sort of abstract it all away. So mm -hmm. the cloud credits could go to, you know, it could be GCP, it could be Amazon, it could be wherever, but they're still getting a, an interface they're familiar with and know how to work with. It'll be interesting to see what a new org would do that would fit into this group. So if there was a new company or uh, institution invented tomorrow, where would they go? You, you imagine they would start in the cloud because it's easy to do so, but I don't know. I suppose the, the counter argument, Jamie, to, to like the data, uh, the big data sets that we have on prem is that companies that use cloud data sets, like pr data providers who are cloud based initially, then if you're in the cloud, you don't have to move them as far to your on prem uh, location. So, uh, you know, we might even be in that state at, at, for some if we wanted to. Yes, it depends whether you're net consumers or producers of data as well, probably. Yeah, yeah. All right, I can I can add here. We I think the the answer for hybrid is is ours. So uh, we are already deploying some workloads uh, in this hybrid mode, and the ones we do are the ones that are um, from this embarrassing parallel type of workload. But we also have a couple where we actually established links, uh, network links between our on premises data center and some regions in different clouds it allows us to kind of expand the data center. Uh, and uh, in there, we can do more, like uh, any kind of co-located workload can go anywhere and still have dependencies on on-premises services. It's much easier to do what Bob was de describing, which is you, re you depend on the Kubernetes API and, and you, you, you just use it for workloads that can be loosely coupled and don't have like it interdependencies that would require uh, low latency or some sort of special network connectivity. And the motivation is really bursting, and especially for accelerators, uh, which we don't have many uh, on premises right now. Mind sharing, like, how much do you guys go into public cloud? Like, when do you, when there is this, this thing, how, how many I don't know, number of nodes do you spin up uh, in public cloud? or these kinds of when that happens? Well, it, it depends, like we, we tune it uh, for 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 the batch systems, we can really tune the amount of resources that are there. Um, for for things like the ML workloads using things like Kubeflow, for example, um, mm -hmm. we actually auto scale the clusters. So um, they will they will only scale up uh, when Got the workloads it. go there, and we try to define policies on what can go there. And do you have one Kubernetes cluster spanning your, uh, that's kind of a hybrid cluster spanning your on-prem and, okay, yeah. No, these are multiple because, endpoints, yeah. Okay, because I was like, that, how that, that would be like a networking miracle. No, it, it's possible because we, for if you choose a region within a cloud, you can set up this, uh, these extensions of the network, and we do that. I we see. expand our own premises data center to this specific region, but this is I not see. not super flexible. So ideally, we would need this Kubernetes API and setting up some sort of VPN if needed. Got it. Okay. There's, a, there's a very cool project that is called um, TensorCoop. Uh, it's a very hacky thing, but it's basically an implementation of the virtual kubelet where the node is backed by a Kubernetes. Oh, API. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, I, yeah, I've heard of one more thing called nodeless, where essentially it's virtual kubelet again. Uh, but so essentially, you behind the scenes, it will go to wherever you want it to run, and it will run wherever, whatever things you want. But again, yeah. cool, very cool. All right. Any other point here? Okay, so then we move to a question, which was, if not already, do you plan to move these workloads to Kubernetes? Please, please expand. And yeah, the couple of questions we had was no, uh, but uh, the ones with more details, it said we have workloads in Kubernetes that support HPC. Some use Kubernetes to launch jobs on supercomputers. So I guess 
that kind of makes sense. Um, then for some workloads, I guess it's the answer. Um, portability being the reason and trying to burst. This is in line with what Bob was describing earlier, I guess. Uh, mostly already on Kubernetes, planning, interested or not. So I guess the, the next question is what's stopping us? We already covered a bit. I don't know if anyone wants to add something. For those interested, what, what is the, sh the stopper right now? Who wants to dig in? Otherwise, we move to the next one. And for like it was it was honestly just a lot of it's what people were used to. Yeah. Sort of going back to what we were talking about earlier. I guess we already covered most of this, I guess. <laughs> All right. So we know Jamie, do you want to pick up this one? Yeah, sure. So this is around asking people if people access Kubernetes directly or via an indirection layer. Uh, it's actually quite interesting, I think. So no responses for just directly. Majority, over the majority being both. Um, none. I suppose people not using Kubernetes at all, presumably. Um, I suppose really is probably what I expected to see in a way. Uh, we can't really tell within the both how much is one or the other. Um, and we've got different, I mean, in our case, anyway, we've got different groups of users where some people are a bit more sort of power users and do access Kubernetes directly. Uh, and obviously the administrators thereof. Um, but most of the, our researchers anyway, go through tools, which we build for them to help them do what they need to do rather than using Kubernetes directly. I don't know what anyone else's thoughts are on this. One question here, when someone says that they use indirectly, does it also mean like CRDs and stuff? Is that also kind of indirect use of Kubernetes or no? I guess I was thinking more like whether you're using kubectl or not. Uh, so Kube use of kubectl is direct. Anything outside of kubectl is indirect, essentially. Right, yeah. So if okay. you've got some kind of Python wrapper framework. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of our users will be doing stuff on Kubernetes. They might not even know they're sort of using Kubernetes in a way. They're sort of using some tools mm -hmm. to build an image and push it and then run some things. Right. And you know, that's what I would consider okay. an indirection layer. It's important also um, for the, all the role-based access control that we've discussed in the past and the past and credential management, all this. Yeah. At the University of Michigan, we had people like at like every tier, people that didn't care, they didn't, they never wanted to see Kubernetes. They just cared that they had a container and it ran someplace. Mm -hmm. um, we had people that like wanted access for like troubleshooting purposes or just to, to diagnose problems. Um, but yeah, we were able to like, and then, then people wanted direct access to the API. Um, and we got really good at having our back profiles to allow that sort of thing and make sure people, you know, couldn't, you know, couldn't get out of their basically namespace. Yeah. I'm also learning a little bit about uh, some of these modern newer projects, uh, or at least modern and newer for me, uh, which is uh, Ray, uh, B -A V A E X. Uh, and I think one more, uh, I think DAX, uh, no, not DAX, DAX is different, uh, Dask. Dask. Yeah. Dask. And, yeah. And some of those things, I believe the way they expect you to run with Kubernetes is you have your local cube config. And so they, the, the Dask scheduler will run pods inside Kubernetes. So the user who's using it doesn't know that, you know, I mean, they, they know that there is Kubernetes, they have to set up some things, but they are not, the user is not the one who runs the kubectl create yeah. and whatnot. So yeah, it are. is. Again, I don't know how many people are using these modern services yet. Uh, again, I don't know about modern. Sorry, I keep saying modern as if 
it's modern for me <laughs> but 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 uh, but it's possible that some people may not they since they themselves don't use kubernetes it's some abstraction layer there it's uh, those might be the cases yeah I think for for the particular case of Dask, it also de depends how you use it because there, there's these two modes where you can submit Correct. directly or using the Dask gateway. Yes, so, that's good. That's right. Yeah, the Dask gateway one where each user has their own cluster. Basically, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, we had a, we had a presentation a while ago about this actually. Oh, okay. somewhere in the archive. Let's move on. So scale. So we just asked uh, compute resources in terms of uh, order of magnitude of CPU cores from 100 to over 10,000. Um, the biggest, well, not one so majority, but the, yeah, the, the, the biggest response is large, which maybe isn't too surprising because that's the kind of thing we're all doing. Um, I don't know who's got less than 100 CPU cores. Interesting to know what they're up to. <laughs> they've got one cluster, I suppose, and they're playing with it. Um, although it was twenty, that was two out of the eight responses, actually. Yeah, we we have half of the replies being ten thousand or more, so it's it's mm -hmm. really pretty relevant sizes. Yeah. How how big is the biggest? If people want to know, to say, can you share, Jamie, or is it? Right. I'm pausing because I don't think I'm allowed to say <laughs> it's bigger than that. It's bigger. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. How about you guys? You're quite large. Oh, we can we can share it. Uh, our data center is three hundred thousand and eighty percent of that is for, for the batch. Yeah. And cores, right? CPU cores. Yeah. Three thousand cores, yeah. I think it's actually more now, but yeah, it's something like that. What's the refresh cycle for you on hardware? Five years. And that just goes along with the experiment. Uh, that's different. Yeah, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't go with it. It's just okay, a fine. five year warranty. All right. Should we move on? Mm -hmm. Should I take this one? Or yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. So the question was about GPUs. Um, it was actually, it was the interest here was to see how much people are already integrating uh, accelerators into these kind of systems. So the replies are pretty much uh, uh, integrating them, although. Um, only one in one case, or no, like, yeah, still quite relevant with a thousand or more, we, we still have quite a bit there. So but one, one question I had, I don't know if people want to say other things about this, but one question I had was, uh, what types of GPUs are this? Is it all NVIDIA? Or, and also, is there any sort of virtualization or is it all like PCI pass-through like, and, and dedicated cards for, for the jobs. Anyone wants to pick this one? I'm wondering if the people not speaking are just not able <laughs> or... Uh... Shout for help on the chat if you can't communicate. Uh, I'd start to want to say that um, the uh, we we added some GPUs. It uh, the hardware took like three months to come in, and we using the GPU operator got the nodes up and running, allocatable in the cluster in like two days. You know, like the GPU operator was awesome, and uh, I really can't say enough about that. I think it's really cool how that's uh, how Nvidia is able to kind of do that and just kind of throw that over the fence. And I don't even know how much they support it. I mean, they do some, but. Um, it's uh it's just pretty solid. I don't know, it was neat. I was excited. I second that. Are you doing any any sort of virtualization of the GPUs or is it just so actually we just here um 
uh, GPUs in to start doing some of that stuff with, but we haven't haven't played with those yet. Those are sitting on the floor, getting getting installed. Hopefully in the next week. So, but yeah, no, we haven't. haven't it was they were Voltas, um, I believe, was the ones that we have today. So, but yeah, so so then you know we get like a Jupyter notebook that allocates a full Volta, and they use it like maybe less than ten percent of the time. So we're like, well, this isn't you know that, that was kind of what kind of prompted the the Ampere having a little bit more finer grained control over scheduling. So. We, we, we offer also uh, the possibility to do uh, this uh, virtual GPU that uh, NVIDIA already supported with T4s and V100s, but it, it was kind of time sharing. Oh, um, okay. We realized that in addition to being very unstable in terms of per performance, there were limitations in doing things like um, um, that there were, there were some bits of functionality that, that were not available um, for, for for this sort of driver, it also needs an additional license, but that we, we managed. I know that the new versions, the 13X drivers, already support all this functionality that we required. So we are giving it another go, but we also are expecting the 100s for, for make. Yeah, cool. Okay, that's good to know. Is anyone doing anything other than NVIDIA? Well, I don't know. I don't think we're doing anything specific. I'm also not sure what we're allowed to talk about, Jamie, in terms of what we're doing other than GPUs. What do you think? Uh, you mean other, other vendors other than NVIDIA for GPUs, though, was the question, I think. Yeah, or other type of accelerators. Are we talking about that question at this point? Uh, I think we got onto that. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was. Uh, the... Yeah. No. No. Um, uh, we, we, I think we're just Nvidia at the moment. Fair enough. Yeah. No, Ricardo, have you, what about you guys? It's Nvidia for now, but uh, yeah, we would like to get uh, something in addition. There, there, are, there are sites because we collaborate with a bunch of sites uh, around the world and there are sites that have an AMD cards as well. Mm -hmm. So we started looking at integrating them so that they run properly, the code. But uh, yeah, for, for now it's, it's all NV. Yeah, I think they've got a pretty mad market share, I would guess. But we also have issues with uh, delivery times. I've been waiting yeah. for them for months. Now. I think that's the case across the board at the moment, but any kind of hardware really. All right. I'll move to the next one because we're actually going fast on time as well. Uh, so the next one is uh, other types of accelerators. I put here FPGAs, but actually one, another reason we burst into the cloud is to use things, things like TPUs as well. So I don't know if someone wants to expand here, especially on the FPGAs, and maybe give some details of how they are integrated. We're I mean, starting to look at FPGAs. We haven't. It, it's, there's, they're not integrated in any of our sort of cloud native Kubernetes type stuff yet, though. That's all quite quite separate beasts currently. Not to say it won't be ever. Yeah, and I think that it, sort of following that, there are a bunch of IPUs and TPUs and, you know, insert whatever character you want thing that people are dreaming up these days that we're looking at in uh, lots and lots of ways. But uh, yeah, there's nothing that's actually doing anything at the moment. You know, we're looking at all the graph cores and Sabanovas and uh, what are some of the other ones? Uh, Tachyons or what are those other ones? Um, Ascension or something like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of those things that are being tested and played around with, but nothing that's gone near to production or Kubernetes status. So. Bob, do you know any any specifics about 
running FPGAs on Kubernetes? Honestly, I experimented with it back when I was at the university, but like outside of uh, mounting the device into into the container, like beyond that, not really. Um, it it never got beyond essentially me messing with it. Okay. Um, I haven't really looked at. I, I haven't looked at it uh, really since then. Okay. Now maybe maybe we take it as an action item also to to, to uh, investigate a bit uh, where we are with this right, maximum taking observations. Uh, I have at least two things, which would be uh, uh, to engage with uh, other communities that we mentioned above, and now uh, maybe investigate a bit more integration with FPGAs. This would be an interesting one. For those that replied, like this is uh, just like seen as a like an extra PCI device that is given to the job, or how does that work? Or just... Oh, sorry, I was. Uh, um... I know there is a way of mounting the device directly in there. Uh, Intel actually has like an operator that that does it too, if I recall. Um, okay. It's all through uh, device plugins. All right. Okay. I think we can move to the next one then. Uh, authentication. So we covered this a couple of times in the past. Um, I think, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to what is already here. I think we see, yeah, X509, Kerberos, OAuth, and the main thing would be how are these credentials being maintained and uh, like refreshed for long-lived jobs and things like this. I guess everyone has this sorted out or any problems there. I just think it's interesting that almost everyone who responds has got multiple things, which I think quite telling. I, I don't know anyone who seems to have got their story straight on this completely. It's a lot, I guess when you're dealing with legacy things and new things, which we all are, there's going to be a combination floating around and that's always a challenge. We haven't got away from Kerberos, it's still alive and well. I mean, if anything, we're getting doing even more of it by the day. Yeah. It's like the zombie's hand coming out of the crypt, grabbing your ankle. You just think <laughs> yeah, totally. There you go. Hi. Okay, so uh, maybe we jump to storage then. Uh, Jamie, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, question around how we handle data in our clusters, what kind of file systems people use or other um, quite split, lots of Ceph, uh, CephFS that is. Um, people choosing multiple as well. But yeah, Lustra, GPFS, HDFS as well. Quite, I mean, that's, yeah. Lots of different various responses. I don't know. Is anyone interested to know if the HDFS people are on the call, actually. I haven't talked much about that previously in our group. Yeah, it'd be interesting so. group whether any HDFS users are looking at Ozone, um, mm. Apache Ozone as a replacement for HDFS. Uh, if any HDFS users are on the call, be interested. But maybe they're not. It doesn't seem like anyone chose. I'm, I'm misreading the color, actually. I just realized I screwed yeah. something. Like that would be why. Yeah, the pinkish thing is CephFS luster deprecating, and GPS, GPFS as the future. All right. 
I, I just saw here also in the chat, Nathan, I don't know if it, you cannot uh, turn the microphone because I just saw a couple of comments that you had that would be quite interesting, which would be uh, how many sites, how many of these sites are using containers in Slurm? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, we Slurm's had all, I mean, forever had integration with the standalone container systems. I mean, Singularity's been quite popular and the new container support coming in. Just be nice to understand how sites are doing that. I mean, in theory, you could take a container, run it here, run it there. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal, right? <laughs> sort of, I don't know. I mean, so did you see that Apptainer is the new singularity? They just, they just announced that the other day. Um, <laughs> The, I feel like, I feel like, you know, HPC containers, people want more than, than what they think they want kind of thing, right? I feel like the name of the game, you know, we were working for a while on trying to replicate singularity container or HPC containers with Podman. And really the amount of holes that you kind of poke in the container, it turns into more of a sieve than it does like a container, right? Because you really... You really want to bind mount up all of all of your your you know your BLAS libraries, you know the GPU like you know you want to pull all that stuff in off the host, right? You know, and it kind of kind of necessarily breaks that isolation. You know, I mean, I still think there's really good stuff about it, um, and uh, and even like uh, like Nersk um, Nersk showed that uh, with what are they? It's not Singularity. They've got their they've got another one based on Docker but that um, Python applications actually perform faster across a cluster in a container than outside of a container, right? Uh, it has to do with the way Python looks up paths for um, linking for dynamic libraries and stuff. It doesn't have as many paths to look up in a container because of the way that the way that you link in a container, I guess, is compared to like a normal HPC host. So it's kind of funny, but um, but I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know. We get we get tons of requests for people to 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 support HPC containers, but, um, and people do use them, but I don't know. I feel like, I feel like, uh, we always have to have this like hard conversation of like, okay, well, you're not going to get, you know, repeatability completely. You're not going to get isolation completely. You know, it's like all these little, you add on to all these things, you know? Uh, um, well, that's, there's been a lot of research, like, a good number of sites on how to get the performance out of it. Like yeah. the common trick now is to bind mount uh, the MPI layer in so that you use, you know, especially on the craze. Yep. And that yep. of course breaks a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, none of these limits are new. Actually, let me go look up the paper or the presentation I have on it. These these lim these these issues have been around a long time. Um, yep. Uh, there was a good when quote. When you want to use when you want to go fast. <laughs> you lose compatibility. Yeah, I mean, exactly. A lot, Necessarily, lot of the Kubernetes right? stuff I have seen, um, you know, 100% utilization isn't exactly at the top of their list, or they want to have some kind of network isolation, and they are willing to pay the price for having um, uh, was it Plaid or something along those lines. On an HPC, that's just not acceptable. I mean, you pay an obscene amount of money for your um, InfiniBand or whatever latency, low latency interconnect, and you want to use it because otherwise you could just be using the one gigabit Ethernet; it wouldn't matter. No. Yep. So uh, find that link. There's a good good quote um, from another guy at a different lab who said that uh, that HPC containers is teaching a whole new generation um, the uh, of of linking. Um, for errors, right? Library linking errors, right? You know, and it's it's so true, because you're right. That's what you're doing. You're you're mounting it up if you want to get the performance. So yeah. Here, I put the uh, the link in there. I mean, we did this back in 2017, hmm. um, and these aren't solvable by containers or anything else. I mean, and the whole world of issues come in when you want to swap architectures or compile against SSC four versus SSC three or whatever. Um, and then there's a lot of sites with the, uh, hard requirement of reproducibility and bit for bit reproducibility. 
at which point you have to basically run an emulator on a new piece of hardware to get that. Yeah. And I mean, it really does matter because you run uh, CSM or Warp, and your hurricane hits Louisiana versus Florida, <laughs> and it's the same input, same program. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, especially with the move to the, uh, the single floats on the GPUs. I mean, you get, you get the fancier NVIDIA ones with the double floats. It's not as much of an issue, but it still matters. And then the lack of the IEEE float standard being consistently implemented completely makes it entertaining. Um, yeah, I posted the link of a lot of the limits that, you know, been around for a while. Um, I don't think anybody's going to really solve any of these anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> I mean, once they solve the halting problem, they can. But uh, my thought is more just to make sure that the containers can work so the user can, you know, develop on their laptop, throw it on the HPC system, throw it on their Kubernetes system, or have them burst to each other, whatever. But it'd be really nice to know how sites are doing that. I mean, right now, there's a lot of uh, glue work that goes in for, like, um, getting Jupyter books to work on HPC or some of them run them on Kubernetes and then burst out to HPC and stuff like that. Really nice to know about, you know, what the sites really need, what they're doing. I mean, I understand the use case of, you know, you want to use Kubeflow, you use Argo or something like that, or Helm. You don't care how it runs. You just want it to run. <laughs> but yep. uh, you hit a lot of the complications. I mean, in a lot of cases, you're going to have to recompile absolutely everything to get it to the full performance. You know, when you're jumping from your laptop, which may be like an ARM Chromebook to, you know, uh, yeah. a Xeon box or something like that, or even a Power 8 or a Power, uh, power 1. Power, what are we, Power 10 now? We should probably uh, skip through the rest of this because I've only got a few minutes now. Yeah, let's browse for the rest and then we can come back. Uh, I think we can go over like three or four minutes till we start at eight as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nate. Yeah, thanks. Uh, should we browse real quickly then? Uh, monitoring, monitoring, we see Prometheus, ELK, uh, FluentD, Alerting with no use. There's nothing like very outstanding there. It's pretty standard, I guess. Yeah, not surprising. All right. So this is coming a bit to what uh, uh, Nathan was just referring, which is uh, how how our container image is built. I think this is a uh, one of the replies I had for him, which is uh, in most cases we don't have people building locally. They they just push somewhere, and there's some sort of CI CD that will build for multiple architectures. Um, so those systems here, we get GitLab, Jenkins, Tekton, and then manually as well. Uh, but then GitLab, Tekton, manual again. Uh, very likely manual. OK, there's quite a lot of manual. Um, GitLab, GitLab CI, Tekton, and Jenkins. It'd be nice to know how they're actually using the GitLab runners or Jenkins to do it. Yeah, so I, I can tell you. I, I can tell you how we do it. We have multiple runners on each of the platforms, and when you push your image, they will build in parallel and then push to the same registry, and then uh, whatever runtime is pulling the image will pull uh, based on the architecture that they they are deployed on. Does that answer your question, Nathan? I meant more like they'd use an SSH to go in, a REST API. What is the runner calling? Or is it going straight through the kubes, the kube API? The runner for building the image, you mean? Or? Yeah, well, like here, the top one, GitLab runners. I mean, there's a few things you could do with that, right? So I'm just wondering how they do it. So for the GitLab runners, you push to a to a branch and then 
the the runner will will get a webhook and will just pull clone the code and build locally on wherever hardware the runner is running, and we we basically replicate them on all the architectures. Someone wants to add something, maybe. All right, then we browse through. Uh, registries, so we have all. That's <laughs> the answer. Um, Watch out. Anyone particularly happy or unhappy with their current choice? Or any any hard issue to raise? We use Artifactory and we've run into some, some scaling problems with it, but we've recently started looking at um, Dragonfly as like a sort of caching. It's like pretty to beer. Yeah, and uh, it's very early days, but it looks pretty good, actually. We started originally looking at something called Kraken, which I think was out of Uber, but it seems to have died in a ditch. So then we sort of moved sideways onto uh, Dragonfly, and yeah, it looks, looks pretty good. And that's sort nice. of taken some of the pain away from, from Artifactory. Anyone else? All right, let's go through. I think we only have two more. So languages, um, it's pretty much like half is Python and then the other half split some Fortran. So that's pretty good. Anything to highlight to anyone? All right, so we go quickly. The last one, additional tools. I guess it's more regarding deployment here. Uh, there's Terraform, Argo CD, Puppet, Argo Twice. Uh, yeah, and Helm. Sounds pretty reasonable. I think, uh, I think that's it. I don't know. Do we want to highlight anything particular? We're already three minutes over. Pretty good, and just want to say thank you for the people that responded. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think I, I took a couple of uh, action items. Uh, I took also from the discussion we just had here about uh, how people are actually using containers in these environments. Uh, what's the motivation to do that, and any kind of limitations they are hitting on their setups. So maybe maybe we take those as um, as topics for for our next session. Otherwise, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we meet in two weeks for uh, Jamie's uh, gem session. <laughs> I think we are going to try and reach out to the Cartographers working group, right? Let's see. If it doesn't work, uh, <laughs> I, I hope you have your guitar. Need, need, sounds like it's on me to sort that out, right? <laughs> cool. cool. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Later.